question I ask you today, taken from this text. Whose image is on you? When you engage in culture and you engage in society, are you representing a, a person from the city of, of man? Or are you representing the God who gave his image and implanted his image on you? Whose image do you bear? Do more people know about your politics than your faith? Whose image do you bear when you engage in the world? Politics are important. They are not ultimate. They are not the most important. How you treat people is more important than who you vote for. Vote. But how you treat people, how you come across in person, face to face, and also in this world called social media. There aren't too many people who've been swayed by opinions through a social media post. Socrates, many, many, many years ago, long before social media came out, asked the question, is it kind, is it necessary, and is it truthful? You may be seated and welcome. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here and just wanted to uh, let you know if we've not met, I'd love to say hello to you after service, answer any questions you might have about the church. We also have an area outside under the blue tent where we can get your contact information so we can follow up with you as well. If you've joined us on a really kind of the beginning of a series, last week we laid the foundation for the series called Kingdom of God. If you missed that, you can catch up online. You can watch that or listen to that message online. It's called the Kingdom of God. And then this week and moving forward, we're going to look at different issues that are facing our current culture. And so it's a Jesus and series here at Boulder Mountain. It's always ever and only about Jesus. And so we're going to look at some of these issues through the lens of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And there's two things that, that we hold on to as we, as we do this. One is truth and the other is grace. The uncom uncompromising conviction of God's word and the other is, is love. And so... We'll walk through this. We ask for wisdom and grace. Now, just a caution, anytime we look at an issue specifically in God's word, uh, typically here at Boulder Mountain, we'll walk through a book of the Bible, we'll walk through a chapter, a specific passage of scripture, and we let that passage tell us what it's saying. The caution with a topical study, it's possible, but we all need a caution when we do this. Number one, we have to lay aside our preconceived biases, what we want God's word to say when we go to the text. It's very easy to bring my, my wants, my opinions, my desires to God's word as I read the text. And I use that as the filter to understand God's word then, rather than say, so I'm gonna lay that aside, I'm gonna go to God's word. When, when God's word where God's word speaks, that's where I go. What God's word says, that's what I know. It's really important. We're people of God's word. So where God's word goes, that's, that's where I go, right? When God's word doesn't speak on a specific issue, here's what we all need to bring to the text. Humility. We all need to bring humility. And so that's what I ask for uh, today as we talk about politics, how are we doing? How are we doing, church? We doing okay? Here's a little, little word as we get started in this, this topic. Jesus is king. Jesus is on his throne. It's going to be okay. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Jesus is on his throne, and there are no term limits with Jesus. He is king. He will never be impeached or outvoted or indicted, or he is the king. He is on his king for eternity. And so I just want to start our message with that is where our hope lies. And who is king of your life is more important than who is president of our nation. Let me say that again. Personally speaking, who is the king of your life is more important than whoever will be president. I know I'm dropping points already and we haven't even gotten out of the gate yet, but I needed to say that. As we get going, I, I love politics. Uh, I'm kind of a news junkie. I, I got into it when I was really young because I had a paper route. 
And when you had a paper out 25, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, <laughs> doing the math real quick, I got to know the news before anybody else did. I got the stack of newspapers at the gas station, and I picked that up. Nobody else in my town knew the news unless I gave them the news, right? And so I read the front page of the paper every day. Like I, I, liked, and I remember really important events, political events. I remember reading those events. I remember when uh, Gorbachev said tear, uh, tore down the wall after Reagan told him to. I, I remember reading that. I remember uh, the first general election I remember watching was Reagan's second term where it was it wasn't really close. He won most of the states except for one. Mondale won Minnesota. And I, I remember that. I was fascinated by this electoral college, that, you know, this republic that we live in. Not a democracy, but a, but a republic. And the opportunity we have here in the states, that was all really fascinating to me. And I've, I'm still uh, enthralled by that. Uh, I like watching debates most of the time. I... I <laughs> I get excited. I, I, I follow along with these things. So let me show you the good and the bad side of politics. In 1990, there was a bipartisan bill that was sent to Congress, which was currently run at the time in 1990 by the Democrats, and there was a Republican president. Because at the time, the most discriminated minority in our nation were those with disabilities in our nation. Those children with disabilities were described as subhuman. There's a place where the most helpless and defenseless of our citizens are left, rotting in inadequate warehouses. It was a model of bipartisan cooperation. A Republican president and a Democrat-controlled Congress signed into the law what we now know as American with Disabilities Act, ADA. That was significant. It brought dignity to millions of Americans. That was, that's a sign of politics, when done right, bring blessing to people, and they're able to work together. Now, let me share with you another story, another side of that, a sadder story in the history of American politics. On May 28th, 1830, despite, despite strong opposi opposition from Christian leaders across the nation, the president at the time signed into law the Indian Removal Act. Nearly 60,000 indigenous people were removed from their native lands, from Florida and Georgia, and they were sent west and forced to migrate to Indian territory. Thousands died on that journey, over 6,000 men, women, and children. It's become known as the Trail of Tears. Both stories show the power of politics, to do good or to do harm, to bless or to curse to give dignity to humans, or to degrade human beings. As Christians, we believe that everything is infected with sin, including politics. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> to say that our current political climate is a dumpster fire is to insult dumpster fires <laughs> in our current culture. And so what does Jesus have to say when it comes to politics? It's important to note the Bible does not speak into a whole lot of things that we're going to go to polls to here in the next two months. The Bible does not speak to a tax rate, what the tax rate should be for Americans. We all have an opinion on that, probably leans lower, but the Bible doesn't speak clearly on what tax rates should be. The Bible doesn't speak clearly on what health care looks like in a nation, if affordable health care, right, if there should be a government plan or not. And so we're to take the values of God's word and the freedom that we have to make convictions, right, in some of these areas. The Bible does not speak to every, every issue that we're going to be voting on. What does the Bible speak about? In Romans chapter 13, it's the first passage we're going to look at today. Romans chapter 13. Paul writes this, and what's the context that he's writing under? He is writing this not living under a democracy. Jesus never voted. Paul never voted. They're living under, Paul, when he writes this, is under one of the worst dictators to ever live. His name was Nero. 
It's really important. When we read this, that's when he's living. Romans chapter 13, Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Every government on the face of the planet, good governments, evil governments, dictators, kings, and presidents have been given their position and their authority by God. Never is that more clear than in the Old Testament when God very clearly says, I'm going to raise up this nation to punish the nation of Israel, to subjugate them, right? It's very clear in Scripture that God would punish the nation of Israel by allowing other nations to rise to power and overtake them. There is no person in authority on this planet that God has not placed there. And every governmental authority who's removed from office, it's because God removed them from office. It's really important to note. And Paul writes that here in Romans. And you're like, can God really rise up and use evil nations for his good? Let me tell you, the most evil act that's ever been done is Jesus and the cross. And God used that most evil act for your benefit and for my benefit. God takes what is evil and he uses it for good. Romans 13. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, now he's getting personal, resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. You and I are to obey the government. Whether you agree with the law or not, you and I are to obey the government. If the government says... You cannot build a wall in your backyard more than six feet high. You, you don't have the right to fight that or to build an eight-foot wall, right? The, gov- the Bible doesn't speak to that. The only time we are to resist the government is when it goes in direct opposition with, with God's word. If we are told to worship somebody else, that would be direct opposition. And so we would not do that. As we looked at the passage last week, be willing to be dragged from our homes as the early church was. But most things, most laws that we uh, are under, we're to obey. Listen, as a follower of Jesus, you're free to be a really good citizen, the authorities God has given. Uh, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. Every police officer and every military personnel is a servant of God, according to this text. They have been placed there indirectly through the government and the authority that God's placed them in. If a police officer asks you to do something, you do it out of respect for the governing authority of the day. So that is what Paul is saying here. You are to be a good citizen. What else is given to government? Government has the authority to prosecute evildoers, to prosecute terror, to punish. Government has the, uh, the ability to restrain the human heart. Think about that. That there is evil every corner of the world, and God has given government the ability to restrain, to do the best that it can to restrain the human heart. Paul goes on to talk about what that looks like. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoers. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities and ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed and to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, I'm sorry to tell you that here today. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Remember the context? This is under Nero, who's beheading Christians and burning them at the stake. He says, be subject to the government. Unless the government asks you to do something against what God's word teaches, then you have the freedom and the right to disobey government. But in most cases, you and I are to be subject to the government. 
It's one of the institutions that God's provided. The very first institution God created and provided was the, was the family. The other institution that God's created was the church. Government is another institution. And it's important to note the church is not the fourth branch of the United States government, right? Am I taking you back to Government 101, American government in freshman year of high school? What are the three branches of government? Legislation, legislative, judicial, and executive. Those are three branches of government. The church is not the fourth branch, right? Anytime the church, is, the church tries to impart behavior or pass legislation, Paul's really clear about this throughout his teachings, that we should not subject people who do not follow Jesus to the same standards and behavior that you and I are, are hold to. That, don't do that. All right? Somebody who doesn't know Jesus does not have the same understanding and conviction of, of what you and I you and I have. So pay your taxes. Be a really good citizen. How you behave is important. It's part of your testimony to a watching world. How you behave and how you act and how you respond and address politics, there's a watching world. You have friends, you have neighbors, you have family members who are watching how you interact. And that says a lot about you as a person and as a follower of Jesus. Politics are important. 1 Peter 2.17, Peter's writing to the persecuted church. And Peter writes this, he says, honor the emperor. And he gets really specific. Honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. Respect those in authority. Now this was in contrast to groups of zealous Jews in that day who recognized no king but God and paid no taxes to no one but God. Part of my role today, uh, I love you all. Part of my role today is to disappoint everybody equally and to talk about, uh, as St. Augustine, Augustine talked about when he wrote his book, City of God. If you need some light reading this fall, you can read the book, City of God by St. Augustine. He talks about the two worlds and the two cities, the city of God and the city of man. In the book, Augustine contrasts two cities the heavenly city and the earthly city. The most significant difference in the two cities is, in, is discovered in what they love. Augustine writes, two loves have made the two cities. Love of self, even to the point of contempt for God, made the earthly city. And the love of God, even to the point of contempt for self, made the heavenly cities. These cities are what they love. And he wrote this at a time where followers of Jesus or early Christians lost their hope in the Roman government, when Constantine became a Christian, they thought Constantine's going to be our savior. And now Christianity is going to spread throughout the Roman Empire. And every generation since Jesus has sought national restoration and political power as a way to usher in kingdom principles. May that not be so with you and I. Politics are important, but they are not ultimate. Ultimate is the kingdom of God. That is important for all of us to know and to understand. In the book of Mark, because the series is about Jesus, and we turn to the book of Mark, chapter 12. What does Jesus have to say about paying taxes? And they sent to him, verse 13, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Herodians and Pharisees did not eat together. They hated each other's guts. Think of Democrats and Republicans. This is a bipartisan effort to trap Jesus. They come together to trap him. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, so they bring him a question. They're trying to trap him. If he says, yes, pay Caesar, pay taxes to Caesar, then he must not be the Messiah, right? Because the Messiah is here to bring in and overthrow Caesar, bring in the, the new kingdom. So surely he can't say that. 
And if he, if he says no, then he's a revolutionist and they're going to report him to the authorities. So they think they can trap Jesus. Uh, you think they would have known by now. Should we pay or not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought him one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Now he takes the coin. This is one of those moments you wish you, you were there for you. And he takes the coin, feels that he looks at it. Now Caesar's coin, on that coin it said Caesar Augustus. His inscription was on it, his image was on it. And it said, a son of God. Now imagine Jesus. Jesus didn't have a coin. Jesus never had a coin. But he's holding the coin of Caesar. And he asks, whose image is on this coin? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. They were amazed by him. Now, the question I ask you today, taken from this text, whose image is on you? When you engage in culture and you engage in society, are you representing a, a person from the city of, of man? Or are you representing the God who gave his image and implanted his image on you? Whose image do you bear? Do more people know about your politics than your faith? Whose image do you bear when you engage in the world? Politics are important. They are not ultimate. They are not the most important. How you treat people is more important than who you vote for. Vote. But how you treat people, how you come across in person, face to face, and also in this world, called social media. There aren't too many people who've been swayed by opinions through a social media post. Socrates, many, many, many years ago, long before social media came out, asked the question, is it kind, is it necessary, and is it truthful? Is it honest, is it kind, is it necessary? Before you post anything in this in this political season, ask yourself those three things. Is this, is this helpful? During Brexit in the United Kingdom, it was common for folks on both sides in the church to say, I don't know how they could vote for that candidate. I can't, you know, we've never heard anything like that over here, right? Across the ocean. I can't believe as a Christian how they could vote for that candidate. The implication is that a real Christian would only vote the way the person making that statement was voting. Such statements do little to foster constructive and healthy community. Have you ever wondered and thought about all the candidates who are running for office? I mean, every intersection, right, is full of signs and billboards and posters. That those individuals are real people. They were made in the image of God. They have real worries and thoughts. They're real people. They have real marriages. They have real families. They have real problems. Have you ever thought about driving through an intersection when you see one of the names? I, I know it's hard to navigate traffic sometimes. These signs are so big and you have to kind of look over or you're going to get hit by a car, right? But while you're sitting there at the light, just take a moment and pray for whoever's name is on that. Is that may we be people who never vote for somebody that we didn't, we never go to the ballot box without spending time in the prayer room. And we would pray for every candidate. Have you ever thought about being in a position that they're in where half the people hate them? I mean, for most of us, it's like 10% of people we interact with don't like us. But you run for office, it's 50%. They don't like you. I had an opportunity recently to pray at the, the Mesa City Council meeting. This is a monthly meeting. I get invited to pray there once in a while, and I most recently I was there, and uh, I try to find a person in charge in the room and ask how I can pray. I'm going to pray corporately, but I wanted to just pay, uh, pull Mayor Giles aside, and I say, how can I pray for you? And he gave me a, an, an answer, uh, a political answer, right, because he's a politician. And I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, no, personally, how can I pray for you? 
And he gave me a much different answer. So pray for her. Pray for the authorities. Pray for our leaders. They've been placed there by God. They will not be there forever. Pray for them. Pray for the people you don't vote for. Because they may win office. Pray that they would have wisdom and discernment. Maybe pray for their salvation. I don't know where all the candidates stand in their relationship with God. God knows their hearts. But I pray for their salvation. If your candidate wins, it will not be as good as you think it will be. Right? If your candidate loses, the other candidate will not be as bad as you think it is. Right? And what St. Augustine does in his book, City of God, is he breaks this utopian mentality that we as Christians should have, or do have, oftentimes. That we think we're going to usher into this amazing government and this amazing kingdom here on earth. So in this, in this passage, Jesus says, pay to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God the things that are God's, and they marveled at him. The United States, the government that we currently live under, it's been a 250-year experiment. Thomas Jefferson says, hey, this is just an experiment. Let's see how this goes. It's gone pretty well. It's it's. The Constitution is one of the most fascinating documents the world has, has ever seen. The preamble says this, the preamble to the Constitution, the purpose of government. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Justice is a good thing. Paul talks about it in Romans 13. The government has the ability to punish wrongdoers, right? ensure domestic tranquility, peace, to bring about peace, provide for the common defense that you and I are protected today by our military. So thankful for those men and women who serve in our military. Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States. If you haven't read that, go and read it. You can find it online, the Constitution. It's a remarkable document. And the founders of our nation, I know a lot has been talked about here recently, but the founders, it can't be debated, had a strong belief in God. They were not perfect people. And they, they made mistakes and they made poor decisions. But there was this foundation that there was a faith in God. And they set up checks and balances. I, in my years, I think every presidential election... I've heard since I've started voting, this is the end of democracy if so-and-so wins the office, right? Now, one day it might be, but that hasn't come to fruition yet. Again, if your can doesn't win, it's not going to be as bad as you think it is. If your can does win, it's not going to be as good as you hope it will be. And so Congress set up the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Let me just say a quick word on judicial and with, with judges. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but many decisions of the Supreme Court are nine to nothing. Really significant decisions that affect your life today. You know why you haven't heard that? Because it doesn't breed anger and fear and worry and anxiety. What's going to make the news is the five to four vote to try to create division among us. There's a lot of times, there's nine Supreme Court justices. I know it's hard to believe, but they do agree on things. May we be, not be captive by social media, by algorithms, by the, the most recent meme or quote that gets thrown out there. Again, let's make sure that we have truth, that we're dealing with what is, what is true and what is, what is accurate. Politics are important, but again, they are not the most important. A uh, couple couple things, and I'll hit some, some points for you. We doing okay? Yeah? All right. Good to know. As kingdom people, we're to be viewed with a side eye. As a follower of Jesus here on earth, we're to be, be viewed as somewhat foolish, side-eyed. Why? Because we are exiles in a foreign land. All throughout the Bible, there are individuals, there's great significant stories of individuals living in foreign lands. 
Can you think of a few? Joseph in Egypt. How do you keep to the convictions of what you know to be true? Not compromise your conviction and be shrewd and use the position God's given you as influence. It's a difficult thing to do. Esther in Persia, right? Daniel in Babylon. Here's what I know as I read my Bible. Babylon no longer exists. Rome no, no longer exists. Persia no longer exists. Nazi Germany no longer exists. And there will be a day the United States of America no longer exists. I don't know when that will be. This country was not created to last forever. No nation has been created to last forever. Nations come. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage? They come and they go. And your hope, my friend, is not found in the flag. It is found in the cross behind me. And as a church, we're not going to wrap the flag around the cross. Our hope is found in the king. Not in a president, not in a governor, not in a mayor. Politics are important, but they are not most important. C.S. Lewis says this. When first things, just about every sermon you got to have a C.S. Lewis quote. <laughs> when first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but they're increased. When number one stays number one, and that's really, really clear, actually number two rises up. And so secondary things become really important, but they don't become ultimate. Second is secondary issues, which we're going to talk about, matter in their right place. And so be known more through your faith than your politics. It's important to be involved in politics. I think of William Wilberforce. I've read a documentary, or I didn't read a documentary. I read a biography on William Wilberforce. He came to faith in a revival in England in 1785. And he befriended John Newton, who used to be a former slave owner, who wrote, who wrote the song Amazing Grace. At first, when William Wilberforce came to faith, he was feeling led to join the clergy, to become a pastor. And John Newton said, no, we need you in government. We need you in government. We need your voice in government. And a month before he died, the British Parliament outlawed slavery in every single province in 1833 because of William Wilberforce. I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who fled Germany when Hitler came to power and he found a more comfortable life teaching in Ivy League schools in the United States. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit led him. He said, I need to go back to Germany. So he goes back to Germany. He starts an underground seminary. He fights fights against the state church in Germany, he ends up giving his life, paying the ultimate price. Before he dies, he write a, writes a book called The Cost of Discipleship, not knowing that he was one day going to give his life. There's a movie coming out about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Think of Catherine Booth, who co-founded the Salvation Army. And the list goes on and on and on. The opportunities that we have to impact to impact culture and society. But that, my friend, is not the goal. That is not the goal. Who is your king is more important than who is your president. Let me ask you this. Have you settled that in your heart? Have you settled who the king is of your life for the rest of eternity? The people we're voting for in your few months, they will only last a few years. But who your king is, who your personal king, who you give your allegiance to, is most important. That is, that is ultimate. Be involved in kingdom work. It said you and I have more of an opportunity to make a difference in 15 miles of where you currently live. Things like HOAs and the PTA and visiting the local hospital and getting involved in local politics. Sometimes who your sheriff is is more important than who your president is. Do you know who's running for office? Now, it's, it's getting hard, right? Especially all the judges, when you go into the booth or if you mail it in, you're like, I don't know all these judges. There's like 45 judges. I don't, I, it takes some work. 
But we've been given a, a significant right and responsibility. Men and women have given their lives for you and I to have the right. For I don't know if we're always going to have it, but right now we have the right to have a say. And so do your homework. Spend some time figuring out who you're going to vote for. Take it seriously. But then lay your head on the pillow on election night with great peace, knowing whoever wins office, it's going to be okay. Jesus is king. He's on his throne. It's okay. Be involved. As we're involved, know that there will be a price to resistance. In our culture, increasingly so. I've never been dragged out of my home because of the convictions that I have. The early church did. There may be a day that may come. But I know who my king is. But you remain faithful to God's word. We're not going to be here at Boulder Mountain. We're not going to be an issues church. There are important Issues are important. We need to address issues. Issues will come. I believe in a year or two years or three years, there'll be other significant issues that we have no idea what they're going to be. They're going to rise. They're going to come up. And God's word is going to give us guidance. So may we be known as people of God's word. 1 Timothy 2 talks about praying for praying for our authorities, praying for those who are in office. As I close here in a few minutes, we're going to take a moment to pray for Scott Smith, who's running for mayor, for uh, Scott Freeman, who's running for mayor. Those two won the primaries. We're going to pray for our, our, those running for president and vice president. Pray. Pray for those who you like and pray for your enemies. I mentioned before, who your king is more important than who your president is. There are no term limits with the rule and the reign of Jesus in your life. It is for eternity. And here's what I know to be true. Jesus fights for you. He serves for you. Those are not political slogans with Jesus. You can trust him on that. In fact, Jesus wouldn't win election in our culture today. He wouldn't. He had all sorts of accusations thrown out. He's too soft on crime. or I mean, it would be a long list of reasons why Jesus wouldn't be elected. But what I do know is that he loves you like no candidate will ever love you. He serves you. He fights for you. He's given his life for you. I bring you to a passage as we close in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It's a passage we often find on Christmas cards coming up here in a few months. And it says this, and we overlook it sometimes. Maybe we don't fully understand the weight of this this phrase. It talks about the government in the Christmas story. And the government will be on his shoulders. Whose shoulders? Jesus' shoulders. Jesus holds the governments all over the world on his shoulders. So the implications for that is I don't have to hold it on my shoulders. You don't have to hold it on your shoulders. Jesus holds all the governments of the world I think about what would it look like if some of these leaders all around the world came to know, know Christ? I don't know where they stand. What if Xing in China came to know Jesus? What if Putin came to know Jesus? What if some of these dictators in Africa came to know Jesus? Do we believe that all things are possible? Then let's pray for that. Let's pray for, for our leaders and the leaders of the world. We ask that God would give them wisdom and discernment. And the government shall be on his shoulders. Jesus holds all governments in place. He brings them to power and he removes them. Be known more for your faith and your politics, who, keen is, who your king is more important than who your president, and how you treat people is more important than who you vote for. Would you join me in pray? In prayer, And as we pray, we're going to lift up these local and national leaders. Would you join me in prayer? And Father, at this moment, as a church, this little church in Northeast Mesa, in Arizona of the United States, we, we pray for those who are running for mayor here in the city of Mesa. I pray that you would give them peace, as Timothy tells us to pray, that we would pray for uh, peace. We would pray for wisdom. 
for these leaders. I pray if they don't know you personally, that you would draw them to yourself. Father, I don't know the salvation status of those running for national office. And so this morning, I pray that you would draw Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz to you. That you would give them wisdom beyond understanding, peace beyond understanding. You'd give them um, clarity. I pray, God, that you'd, you'd give them truth, the truth of your word. Give them courage along with their wisdom. Father, I pray for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. I pray you, the same things for them. I pray that they would, they would be known as people of conviction and, and courage, that they'd come to know you personally as their Lord and Savior. And Father, now in this room, I pray if there's anybody in this room who's not settled in their heart, who is the king of their life, that they would make that decision here today. That they would recognize that Jesus, you are the, the greatest king to ever reign. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And you have no term limits. You will rule and reign forever, first in our hearts, and one day in a real kingdom. So Holy Spirit, I pray you would convict us. You'd call us to repentance for not making you ultimate. Forgive us when we have chased after the things of this world that will only leave us wanting more. I pray in this room for the next few moments that you would move and work, that we would respond accordingly to what you're speaking to us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.